All right, hey everyone. My name is Rich Tabor, and I'm a WordPress theme and plugin developer. I mostly lean on the product side of things, and I sell on ThemeForce and Creative Market and other marketplaces, as well as my own site. Um, so last year at WordCamp US, I was sitting in the crowd. Uh, you know, I bet some of you were also in there, and just watching Matthias go through his demo, and I was pretty impressed. Just watching someone just go through and visually create something out of nothing, whereas now in the visual editor, it's much more difficult. You're adding short codes for things. You're going to add custom post types, creating stuff, trying to pull it back in. It's just kind of a mess. So I was just pretty excited, and I knew at that point that I wanted to dive in and explore Gutenberg block development. So I did. So let's see a show of hands. How many of you have actually tried Gutenberg in any sort of fashion? OK, so about half. So out of all of you, how many have looked at the code behind Gutenberg? OK, 40%. Now, how many of you have actually started building your own blocks? OK, we got one, <laughs> two. <laughs> so that's pretty good. You know, now is the time to really start exploring this opportunity and really to be a part of the next level of WordPress. So let's get to it. I just tweeted out all of my sides. Um, so if you want to pull them up on your own computer and follow along, that's fine too, or your phone. Um, so it's at Richard underscore Tabor. And my goal here is not to teach you necessarily how to build a block in the next 30 minutes. It's, there's a lot of different concepts and ideas to, to kind of grasp to build a block. But what I do want to do is give you some ideas, give you some tools, some insights, and really to give you the confidence to kind of be able to go on your own and figure this out. And of course, you can ping me on Twitter, and you can go onto the core editor Slack group uh, within WordPress.org Slack, and you can ask just about anything you want there. There's a lot of developers that hang out there and answer all sorts of questions. So what you should expect is we're going to go over the anatomy of a block, what exactly consists of a block, building your first block plugin, loading assets, trying to get everything up and running, some different ways to add options to your blocks using block controls and inspector controls, and then some additional resources that you can fall back on when you're trying to do this on your own. So first up, what's a block? It's editable stuff. It's just anything that can be editable. It doesn't necessarily actually have to be editable. It's just a block of content. And by editable, it's you can add it somewhere or you can take it out. And it's its own dynamic piece of content. It's also important to note that they're almost entirely written in JavaScript. So if we look at the WordPress.org website, we can imagine different elements here being blocks, like a hero area. This could be a block, or it could be just a regular header title with some different extension added, or background color extensions added to it. We could have the language selector could be its own block. And it could be dynamic. It could pull in languages based on where you're at, not just you know, text. Then we could have the tagline, which could be its own custom block that, that you use within your agency for your customer sites. Or it could be simply just a style like the header block styled. Because when you think of things in the block approach mentality, you can really start to understand all the things we can do. It's not just paragraphs and headers and list items and images and galleries. It could be anything. It could be feature sets. It could be team members. It could be... Um, you know, when you have a website that has like a picture on the left and your content on the right, it could be very dynamic. You can kind of extend outside of the reach of what you're currently seeing in the core Gutenberg plugin. So let's get up and running. The easiest way that I find to personally get up and running is to install what's called Create Gutenblock. And Create Gutenblock is a zero configuration toolbox that you literally put on, your, uh, put on your machine, and you can run it to simply download everything you need to get your feet wet with Gutenberg. Sure, once you learn things, you're going to want to go in and kind of tweak things and do things your way, but it's a, the best way to kind of get started. So you're, to do that, you first need to install Node.js and Node Package Manager if you don't already have them installed. I have a download link here. Second step is to open up Terminal and then install Create Gutenblock. Third, you're going to navigate into your local, so you're going to set up a local installation on your machine and then navigate to the WP Content Plugins folder and then run Create Gutenblock and then the name of your block. In this instance, the name of the block is just block name. And then you're just going to start it up. You're going to navigate into your block folder that just got put there and hit NPM Start and press Enter. What that's going to do is install a bunch of stuff right here for you. You've got your main plugin file, 
you're going to have a README that's just a demo for you. The important part here is the source folder where you're going to have your block assets, the block.js, editor.scss, and style.scss. Then you have your blocks.jss file, which is going to load in your blocks. And then you have an init.php and common scss, which is just you know, standard stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty too easy, right? <laughs> so I just mentioned those assets, right? So what are those? We have a few block assets to go over. The block.js is your actual registration for your block. It's the file that's going to load in the meat for your block. Without that, you wouldn't have a block at all. Then we have the style.css. In this case, it's the base style sheet. It's the style sheet that loads within Gutenberg inside the editor and also on the front end whenever that block is rendered. Then we have the editor.style sheet, which is the editor style sheet. This is pretty unique. It's the style sheet that only applies within Gutenberg, not on the front end. So think about it this way. You have a, a common shortcode that we see is a button shortcode, OK? So we have a button shortcode right now that we are going to convert to a block. We converted it to a block. And on the front end, we want to put some margin below it to match all the paragraphs that have margin bottom, right? But within Gutenberg, you, might not, you wouldn't want to have that margin bottom assigned, because Gutenberg does apply some spacing between blocks. So if you had a margin bottom of 35 pixels on the front end, and on the back end, you're going to have extra space on the back end. So you would just set in your editor style sheet that that button should have a zero margin bottom, and it would override your style sheet. So let's look at registering. It's kind of hard to see, but I'm registering essentially all three scripts here. And again, I put these online so you guys could follow up on them. I have the block.js here, the block editor style sheet, and then the base style sheet loaded here. And I have a few dependencies, which are pretty standard. They're going to load some libraries to help you build your blocks. So we're going to grab the handles, which are I have here just WCATL block editor for both the block.js and the editor style sheet, and then just WCATL block for the styles. And we're going to plug them in here. What we're doing here is essentially registering those styles in script to load whenever we need to. If we enqueued them normally, like you do a theme style sheet, you would essentially have them loading on every single page and post, no matter what. So using this method, they're only enqueued and used whenever you need to. So now we're in a JavaScript world. That's it for PHP. <laughs> so wipe the sweat, and let's <laughs> move on. <laughs> Block registration. Now that we've got our assets registered and ready to go, and you've installed Create Guten Block and everything's there, let's talk about block registration. Within that block.js file, you're going to start building your block. There's a register block type function, and it takes two different parameters. We've got the, or arguments, we've got the block name and then the block configuration object. The block name is pretty simple. It's just the namespace slash block name. And the namespace would be your vendor name, for example. Like I would use theme beans or my last name Tabor, maybe. And then the block name, here I just said block name, but if I was building a spacer block to space out content, it would be spacer, something simple. And names have to be structured as such, and they have to be lowercase, alphanumeric, and they cannot start with a letter. Now the fun stuff, the block configuration object. So this object takes quite a few different properties. We have the title, which is the title of your block that you see within Gutenberg. Uh, for instance, the paragraph block is called the paragraph block. And here we just have the block title is Hello World. We have description, which shows up in little pieces here and there within the Gutenberg editor. And you want to keep this pretty short, like a sentence. That's about it. Then we have an icon. So when you hit the little plus icon within Gutenberg, it's that icon you see associated with your block name. We have category, which is where your block is sitting within that inserter. There's a couple different categories like common, layout, formatting, so you would kind of assign your block to where it should sit within that uh, inserter there. And then keywords. Keywords help folks find your block when they're searching for it during the inserter. So they'll hit the little plus icon, and they might search for uh, Hello World or Atlanta, or they want to say hi. And then any if you said hi, it would come up. But if you were typing hi and I didn't have a keyword assigned, it wouldn't come up. If you typed hello, it would, because the title is hello, but that's otherwise. Now we have the big ones, attributes and then the edit and save function. Let's split these out because they're a little bit deeper. Attributes are the JavaScript object that holds all the data for your entire block. For, think of it this way. For each editable piece of your block, 
you have to have an attribute assigned to that. That way it can be used to render within Gutenberg and then also pulled to the front end. And all of those attributes have sources. And this is how you define what that attribute actually is. So let's look at some examples. I have here a URL attribute with a source of attribute with a selector of image and an attribute of source. <laughs> it's kind of confusing, but let's talk it through. <laughs> so what I'm saying here is that I want the URL to be the image's source value. Can you see that? So the selector is what we're looking for, and the attribute is the source within what we're looking for. And that's how we're going to get that value from the attribute. And then for the text example here, we have a fig caption element, OK? And our attribute of caption is going to grab the text from that fig caption and save it as our attribute value. And third, I have children. Children's a little bit more complex, but it's the same idea. We're pulling the child nodes of an element. So in this example here, I have a content attribute, the source of children, and then for the selector, I have a paragraph. So if I have just one paragraph within my block, I'm saying that all the child nodes within that paragraph, so that's the bold, any formatting, bold, italic, strike throughs, or breaks, any of that sort of stuff, is going to be the content attribute value. So when it's saved, it's everything you see right there. And that basically sums up attributes. There's a couple more attributes, like HTML and queries. But those you can find on the WordPress.org uh, Gutenberg handbook um, when you're starting to dive in and figure things out. These are just the common ones. So for the edit function, the edit function is everything you see within Gutenberg. It's how your block renders when you hit Add and you select your block. And this is an example, if you can see it, from the verse block within the core Gutenberg plugin. So right here we have the edit function, we have some properties, and we have some constants and the return. So let's look at this. For the properties, this is the important part. And once you get this, everything else kind of falls into place. OK, I promise. <laughs> the attribute properties here that I've highlighted basically pull in the available attributes that we just assigned right above in the registration. Okay, and they can be used and manipulated through the elements that we're putting in there and the components. The set attributes uh, property does just that. It sets the attribute to a value somehow through user interaction. In this case here, it's tough to see, but I have a rich text component with the tagline of preformatted text, the pre, and I have an on change function. So essentially, when the text changes as you're typing in, we're going to update that content attribute. So that way, it's, it's up to date. And then we have class name, which returns the class name of the block, which is wp-block-your namespace slash vendor, or your vendor slash block name, but the slashes are turned into dashes. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. It's, it's just how it's used to reference your block. And then last, we have is selected. Is selected is really neat, because this is where we get some of the UX side of Gutenberg. Because you can show and hide elements that you're using within your block based on if you're selected on it or not. Uh, for example, um, if you're looking at the paragraph block right now in Gutenberg and you click on it, you'll see the bold, the italic, the uh, strike through, and the link options pop up for you to use. You don't need those there all the time. You just need them when you're interacting with it. And that's where you would use the is selected property. And this is what it looks like, the verse block within Gutenberg. And I've added a verse to it and then I bolded the top of it. It's just a simple rich text component with the child node paragraph uh, attribute pulled in right there. And the is selected part is pulling up my toolbar automatically. And that sums up the edit function in a very easy way. You can do a lot of really cool stuff, like bring in different components. You can set resizable boxes. You could do almost anything there. That's where the cool part is. But to get started, if you understand the rich text component, that's how you are going to manipulate things a whole lot. Now the save function. The save function, in one essence, is similar to the edit function, but at the same time, it's completely opposite. <laughs> the edit function you know, is everything inside of Gutenberg when you, hit, when you open up Gutenberg and, add, and click Add Post. The save function renders whatever that block saves and puts it on the front end. So all the attributes that are saved are now put on the front end. So it looks a lot simpler. Because we don't need all the components. We don't need all the stuff that you need within Gutenberg to make all the fun activities happen. So here, all I'm doing is setting two properties, because that's all we need, the attributes and class name. 
I'm returning a preformatted pre uh, text tag with the class name of the class name that we're using. And I have attributes.content, which pulls in that content attribute that we already assigned and that we manipulated by adding content into. And then we hit save. It saved it. it this is our save function. And then this is what it put out. Now in the future, when themes really start integrating with Gutenberg, they're going to style the Gutenberg instance that you saw just a second ago to look just like this. So when you hit save, there's no difference. That's the future of Gutenberg and themes. Because right now, you know, it's pretty different, like the editor instance within Gutenberg. But it doesn't have to be. And there's already ways to do that right now. <laughs> and that's the core of a Gutenberg block in like the simplest way. Okay? So, and you know what's really cool is I'm using examples throughout this presentation that are included in the core Gutenberg plugin on the GitHub repository. And that's because it's such a good resource to look at all the valuable code and see exactly how the like, brightest minds on Gutenberg have done things. And you can pull those exact same things. If you're using ES Next and the uh, modern JavaScript, you can pull that exact same stuff and use it in your block, exactly the same. So now let's look at the fun stuff, like inspector controls. So inspector controls essentially add extra options to your block. So right now, in the paragraph block, we have a bunch of different options. We have the button group. We have range, toggles, colors, block alignment, text. And then I added um, a section from the latest post settings here, which includes a query control and select, which means you can actually select what posts you want to display within something. And this is, again, all of these are inside of the core Gutenberg plugin, so you don't have to recreate the wheel at all. You can literally do a command and search and find what you're looking for and then plug that in here. So let's look at the code behind this stuff. And let's see how it kind of connects to what we just did within the edit function. This is an example from the button block. Okay, I chose this because it has a couple, uh, or it has quite a few less different uh, controls and options than the text and the verse do. So we have here an is selected property, which means we're essentially showing this only when the block is selected. We don't need to show these options if we're not using the button block. And we have a panel body, and then three options, a toggle, a panel color, and then another panel color component. So if you look here, we're also using set attributes. And this is just a function up above that does the same thing. So we're using this set attributes property to again set the attribute of that attribute here, text color, to whatever the value of this uh, option is or this component that we're setting. So this is what you'll get right there. You'll have the toggle up top and then the two color options. So now let's look in some live previewing because when you're manipulating blocks inside of Gutenberg, you want to be able to see some live uh, feedback whenever you're changing colors and such. That way you don't have to push publish and see what it looks like on the front end because that's what we're trying not to do. Now we have a snippet from the button blocks edit function. So here we have a span. We have a rich text again because almost any time you edit text, it's going to be using a rich text component. We have a couple different settings here, but the important one is this style bit here. Because what we're doing here is saying that whenever the style of color is changed, we want the background color of this, block, of this rich text element to emulate that. So as we change it, pick up red or pick green or pick blue, the background color right here will change. And the same goes for the text color in an update on the fly right there. So now let's look at the save function. We're doing the same thing here. We have this save function here. We have the attributes property up top. And then we have button style. You can see we're also doing, we're doing the exact same thing here. We're saving the button style uh, constant here, which has the button color and color options. And we're saving it as an inline style for that button. So when you hit publish, it looks just like it did on the edit screen. There you go. <laughs> and that sums up inspection, in, inspector controls. There's a whole lot of stuff you can do with inspector controls. But one thing to remember, is you don't want to go overboard with the options that you're giving people. And, and even so, for clients, you don't want to give them a million ways to do something. Sometimes you just want to give them one or two. You want to keep things kind of limited. And that's part of the, the user experience side of building these blocks. Then we have the block toolbar. So the block toolbar is, like I said earlier, that little toolbar that pops up 
on the is selected property when you select something and it has some options. There's block alignment toolbars, there's text formatting toolbar stuff that is built into Gutenberg, but there are also things that you can do yourself. So let's take a look. Right here, I'm returning the uh, edit function from the button block, and I'm using the is selected once again, and I have a block controls component now with a block alignment uh, toolbar component inside of it. So what that does, and it has a value of a line, which is important, and then the on change is set to update the alignment using set attributes, just like we always have. And this is what we'll get. We'll get the block alignment toolbar, which is those five icons over there. And the, the cool thing about Gutenberg, like I just said, is that there are bits of pieces that are used inside of Gutenberg that you can just easily reuse or even are automatically assigned. Like the rich text component will automatically pull up the bold, italic, and strike through. You can easily opt them out using your rich text component, but by default those are put there because as a user you would expect to be able to bold something every time you type something. That's just part of the UX that they put already in place. So what you can also do is add some custom controls. Say you have a, right now the latest post block has a grid layout and a list layout option. So you can show things in the list or side by side. And the way they do that is by using the block controls um, component down at the bottom, and now they're using just the toolbar. And for controls, they set up top two different options here. We have the uh, list view and then the grid view. And at the same time, they're also on, their on-click functions are setting the attributes for, uh, for layout to list or to grid. Doing the exact same function, except for now we're changing it to either list or to grid. And this is what that looks like. There's two little icons there. And you can set for the grid view icon and the list view icon, you can set those to any dash icon um, available in WordPress, or you can make your own icons, uh, SVG icons, and load them as well. But again, you want to make sure you're conforming to the user experience offered by Gutenberg. You don't want to have a, um, a lot of stuff in the block toolbar right here, because this is supposed to be kind of a on-the-fly editing decision. You're like, OK, cool, this would be great as a, as a grid view or list. You wouldn't want, like, I want this to be red, I want this to be green, or I want to have this font size, or this spacing, or this text all right here. Those are reserved for the inspector controls panel. And a key part with adding these extra things like this, or extra inspector control options, is that you want to make sure that your block is following all the rules that Gutenberg blocks have already done for you. If they're doing it a certain way, you should probably do it too, because you don't want your block to stand out in such a, a odd UX way that people are not sure of what's going on when they're using your block. You don't want anything unexpected. You realistically, as a, from a UX perspective, you want your block to feel almost the same as if they were using a core block. To have that same sort of feel and everything just kind of works the way they would expect it to and not have to relearn something. Because that's the whole thing with Gutenberg is we're trying to make it easy to do rich content. And by easy, it's also by keeping things the same or familiar. So last up, I've got some resources to help you kickstart your block development. The Gutenberg Handbook is a pretty good place to just kind of dive in and just read up on things and try to identify things. Or if you're like, what exactly is inspector controls? You could just search for it there. It's pretty good. Create Gutenblock is what I was talking about earlier about how to get started really quickly and just try to play around with it. The Gutenberg examples on the uh, WordPress GitHub repository is, is actually really, really good. And these aren't included in uh, the core Gutenberg plugin. But the good thing about these is that they have the ES Next versions, like the modern JavaScript, but also the classic vanilla JavaScript versions of the same block. So if you're familiar with one, you can kind of relay the two. And if you're not familiar with either, I would learn a little bit about both, but then start really diving into learning the new stuff. Because all the blocks within Gutenberg are written using the new stuff. And it's going to be so much easier to try to identify what's going on using like the 20 or 30 examples they have in the, in the block plugin now. And then the last one is uh, my blog, richtaber.com. I write a whole lot, and I've been writing about Gutenberg because that's the hot topic. And I've been writing about what I've been learning, and it's been just fun to do and fun to share. And um, I like getting feedback and such. And I've got a few more posts lined up. Um, so you can go there. So is your mind blown? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.